an honor for me to be here with you today in these historic council chambers. I bring you greetings from the President of the United States, Barack Obama, and from the Secretary of the Interior, Kenneth Salazar. Um, appreciate this opportunity to communicate with you on a nation-to-nation -nation basis today. Um, before I came out here, when we were setting the schedule, my chief of staff, Paul Sosi, told me that it was traditional for the assistant secretary to uh, meet and report to the Navajo Nation Council. Uh, I don't know if that's a fact, if it's traditional, but you know, Paul Sosi was selling it to me, and I, uh, I bought it, so I'm here. Um, and, you know, without it actually being a tradition, I knew that it would be a priority to be here uh, to address the council uh, because the Navajo Nation is the uh, most significant uh, uh, tribal nation that we have in the United States in terms of your membership and your large land base and your treaty. And uh, that's, of course, not lost upon me and Mike Black and Keith Moore as we gather in these chambers today. And if I didn't understand that, I want you to know that back in Washington, D.C., I'm surrounded by senior staff and key leaders that are Navajo, and they would, they would remind me of that. I already mentioned my chief of staff is Paul Sosi. That sounds like a Navajo name, doesn't it? <laughs> and uh, my executive assistant, the one that I rely on most, is Patrice Atin, Navajo. Mm -hmm. And uh, my congressional affairs representative is Darren Pete, who grew up right in the Window Rock area. And my lawyer uh, in the Department of Interior is Hillary Tompkins, Navajo. So you can see that you have, you have enormous influence, and, and I would say I want to just thank you for sharing the leadership of your people to Indian country nationwide. Not only do you provide significant leadership for Indian affairs nationally, uh, but I was told just before I came out here on some of the very key things that we do. Uh, for instance, our interior consultation policy, uh, Navajo Nation was heavily involved in that. Uh, last year, when the president met with uh, 565 tribes that were invited to Washington, D.C. in December, and he made an announcement that got him a standing ovation, that was the endorsement of the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. I was told that Navajo Nation was very critical and important in, in raising the profile of that issue and making sure that the attention of the United States was focused on that so that we could get that across the line. So thank you for what you do for all Native people in the United States. And if even with that uh, significant influence, um, I know something about the Navajo Nation because I grew up in Farmington, New Mexico. Uh, from the time I was about two years old uh, through high school. And my father worked with Navajo people all over the Navajo Nation's homelands. have very fond memories of those times. Being in, in uh, communities across your homeland here, my father employed Navajo people. Uh, uh, Bert Sandoval uh, caught my attention as I walked into the chamber today, and he said, remember when I worked for your father? And he said some very kind things about my father, who is now deceased. And I feel like I have a special bond so when I uh, came in as assistant secretary, uh, which was about 29 months ago, I uh, just told everyone that was involved in interior Indian affairs that I was going to take a few uh, months to kind of get the lay of the land before I 
made any leadership changes in the key people that serve Indian country in the interior. Uh, but eventually, I changed the director of the Bureau of Indian Affairs and also the director of the Bureau of Indian Education. And these two individuals that are with me today are the people that were selected. For Mike Black, uh, I consulted with other regional directors and tribal leaders that he had worked with. Uh, he was serving as the Rocky Mountain uh, Great Plains uh, Regional Director, and he had a very good reputation. He wasn't applying for the job. He got drafted into service. And I'll tell you, you know, I had to lean on him just a little bit because, you know, people really don't like to go to Washington, D.C. and live there. But uh, he was willing to serve, and he's done an excellent job. He's got the confidence of the Secretary of Interior, and he's got my confidence. He's done a great job because he's worked with the Bureau of Indian Affairs for a long time. He's respected by his colleagues. And for Keith Moore, uh, we, uh, very early in the tenure of Secretary Salazar, uh, the Secretary wanted to meet with Ec education, Indian education experts in the United States to talk about the work that we do in the Bureau of Indian Education. And Keith was one of about a dozen Indian education experts that met with Secretary Salazar. And uh, he stood out in his comments that day. And eventually, as we decided to make a change there, he was the one that we selected. Now, it doesn't make a lot of sense because you've got a Pawnee sitting here surrounded by two Sioux. <laughs> you know, and those were our enemies in the old days. Uh, but I had a little, you know, agenda. I wanted to get these Sioux where they reported to me so they could return the horses. <laughs> they could take them, you know, from my people. But that, I don't have those horses yet. You know, I'm still working on that. But. They're doing an excellent job, and it, and it just really thrills me to see that we've got Sharon Pinto that's been uh, called into service to serve as regional director now for Navajo. And Monty Russell has a key responsibility now. You know, Navajo persons serving Navajo people, you know, because our most significant investment in the Bureau of Indian Education comes here within your Navajo homelands. And so we have good, strong leadership, but we've got a tough job that is before us. I met earlier today with the speaker, with President Shelley, with the members of the Navajo Nation Council. We met for about an hour with the council members, talked about a lot of issues. We were listening very carefully. I'm not going to be able to go through all of the major things that we work on, but. I like that uh, opportunity to see people face to face and not only for us to uh, come out into your homelands and sit down with you and have that kind of dialogue and exchange, but I hope you know that you're always welcome okay. if you choose to come to Washington, D.C. to sit down uh, with us and visit about the issues that are important to your community. And we have a policy back there in Interior Indian Affairs that if any tribal leaders come to Washington, D.C., we're going to try our best to arrange a meeting with you. And specifically, if I am available, I will try to do that. If I am not, because I travel a lot, an Obama political leader, meaning in Indian Affairs, I have uh, assistants that work with me. They're appointed by the White House. And so we will have those key leaders in those meetings so that you're uh, talking with career, BIA, and BIE people, but also the political leadership of the President of the United States in Indian Affairs. So, I want to take you back to 2009 in November. It's when President Obama delivered on a promise that he had made as he campaigned for the presidency of the United States. And remember, he did something that is not normally done. He actually went into Indian country and campaigned, asking for Indian votes. And in that process, he made promises to Native people. And he's been delivering on those promises. One of them is that he would meet with uh, tribal leaders in the first year of his presidency. And I thought, as well, like many people thought, what he would do is invite maybe a dozen select tribal leaders to meet with him in the White House, and that would fulfill his responsibility. But what President Obama did is he invited, at that time, 564 tribes to send leadership to Washington, D.C. 
to meet with him. And of course, the White House is not large enough to accommodate that number of people. So they met in the Yates Auditorium in the Department of Interior that holds over 700 people. President Obama not only gave a speech, he participated in town hall dialogue that day with tribal leaders, and he brought his cabinet officers with him. And they dialogued throughout the day with tribal leaders. It was a good day. And I, I wanted to mention that because at the end of the day, when the president was once again speaking with these hundreds of tribal leaders, he said something that I will always remember. As he looked out over these hundreds of tribal leaders, he said, without any talking points, without any teleprompter going, anything like that, he was speaking from his heart and soul, and he said, I promise you, as long as I am president of the United States, you will not be forgotten. Those are big words, because there are so many issues that we're called upon to, to deal with. There are so many needs that over generations, you know, have been built up. It's difficult to solve a lot of these things overnight. But I want you to know that you have a President of the United States and a Secretary of Interior that care about what is happening in the lives of Native people across the country. And that is my job now to uh, work with Keith Moore, with Mike Black, with the other career employees in these agencies of Interior, Indian Affairs, to do all we can to move forward advancing tribal nations on a nation-to-nation -nation relationship. Uh, that day, in November of 2009, the President announced that we would improve the consultation process. And he wasn't talking only about interior Indian affairs. He was talking about all departments of the United States of America. And he, can, he uh, by executive order, required them to go out and consult. This sounds kind of strange. Consult about how to consult with tribes. And we did it. Departments of the federal government have done that. We are now in the 11th hour of that process where very soon we will announce the final documents that have been pr produced with the input of tribal leadership, including the Navajo Nation's voice about how we should transition into a better way of dealing nation to nation to give you a greater voice in what is happening in the decisions that affect your communities. So that's what this administration is all about. And in the spirit of that, although we don't have that new consultation policy, we have consulted on something that is very important to the Navajo Nation and other tribes in the state of Arizona, and that is the Navajo Generating Station. And that consultation has been going on for some time. We've had numerous meetings with the President of the Navajo Nation and other officials of the Navajo Nation. Uh, just recently, we received another letter from President Shelley calling for formal government-to-government -government, you know, consultation because EPA is about to make a significant decision. Interior is responding to that by not only holding consultation again, but uh, we're, we're on the reservation that Homelands Today talking about that. But a study has been commissioned to make sure when that decision is made that all of the pertinent information is placed before EPA in that process. Now, that is not a decision that the Interior Department is going to make, but we're going to make sure that we're fulfilling trust responsibility in communicating all the pertinent information to EPA and giving our point of view, making our arguments in favor of what the Navajo Nation would like to see as an outcome there. And uh, education is one of the top priorities of the president when it comes to Indian country. And Keith Moore has addressed some of the key issues there. I just want to say that um, I was honored to be able to come to the Navajo Nation and attend the groundbreaking you know, initially for the Rough Rock Community School, which Keith already said, Keith Moore said, was the largest uh, uh, era American Recovery and Investment <coughs> project that we had, 50, almost $57 million worth. And then to 
come back uh, just recently for the dedication of that school. We have been able to either replace or do major repair on 28 Indian schools across the United States because of the era funding. I know a lot of people complain about the stimulus money that came out because, you know, it brought a lot of dollars out there. But these dollars reach Indian country. Not only were we able to build new schools or to do major repairs that were needed, improvements in these schools, but it created jobs in Indian country. I was in Ignacio, Colorado recently at a meeting where uh, an Indian woman stood up and she said, a lot of talk is out there about the, the deep recession we were in in the United States. People are concerned that we have like 9.1% unemployment. She said, for generations, we as Native people have lived in a deep recession or worse for generations. Our unemployment figures reach as high as 85% in some of these communities. Don't talk to us about recession. We have needs out there, but we're moving forward. And education is a linchpin of how we're going to make an advancement and achieve the kind of promise and prosperity that the first Americans deserve. And there's something very special about land. This administration understands that. It's called land into trust. And I testified just last week in the United States Congress addressing a case called Kacheri. It was decided in the early part of 2009 where the United States Supreme Court made a ruling that cut off uh, it was a very technical, very specific ruling that made it, uh, it, made it uh, impossible for some tribes in the United States to have land taken into trust for them. Those are our brothers and sisters. And I was testifying there for legislation that would fix that problem. Uh, this is very important. Uh, Navajo Nation doesn't have to worry about that. You know, but there are other tribal nations that are now paralyzed and not being able to have land taken into trust. Some of these tribal nations are even landless. We need, once again, the support, the strength of the Navajo Nation to speak up, to continue to speak up, and help our brothers and sisters. This administration supports what we call a clean Kachiri fix to have Congress rectify that problem so that all tribes have an opportunity to restore some of their homelands. And this administration understands that because in the prior administration, in the last two years, they took into trust only 15,000 acres of land nationwide. And by the time that I came in, the administration under President Obama came in, the system of taking land into trust was pretty much shut down. We got it up and running again. The handbook that the Bureau of Indian Affairs uses to process these applications has been revised. It's meant to streamline, have a more timely process. And now, within the first two years of the Obama administration, comparing it to the last two years of the Bush administration, there's been a 488% increase in the number of lands taken into trust on behalf of tribal nations. And it, we're only beginning because land is sacred. And when it comes to land, some of the decisions that are made about the use of that land have in the past been made by the Bureau of Indian Affairs. And there have been complaints about how that's been a slow process or how the decisions, the outcomes are not appropriate. This administration has been supporting giving tribes a greater say in those decisions about how to lease lands. Uh, signing on in support of legislation that is meant to accomplish that, but we're not satisfied with that. We have been involved in the consultations that will lead to revising regulations of the Bureau of Indian Affairs that have been on the books for more than 50 years without change. And again, it's meant to streamline those processes to give tribal governments a greater say in how those trust lands are administered. Now, I know that I've probably taken more time than I should, but I 
wanted to also say that uh, there have been significant gains made in the budget. Um, do you all remember what things were like in January of 2009 when the president came into office? What was the climate in the country like then? Do you remember that when he was inaugurated? We were uh, moving in, we're in the midst of the Great Recession. Uh, they said the worst economy since the Great Depression. Uh, the financial institutions of the United States were on the verge of collapse, right? Wall Street, the banks, what had happened to the stock market? You know, it would lose about half of its value. Housing market values had plummeted. We were losing 750,000 jobs a month. You know, that's what greeted Barack Obama when he came into office. And what do you think I was thinking as the Assistant Secretary when he asked me to serve and I was eventually confirmed by the Senate? Were we going to see budgets that would increase in Indian affairs in those tough economic times? When the economy is bad, you see cuts, right? And that's what I expected. The first budget the President dealt with wasn't even his budget. It was created by the uh, Republican administration. Bush administration. It was on the table. But what the president did is within three months added within Interior Indian Affairs $183 million and the Congress stood strong with him to increase, not decrease, the budget for Indian Affairs and Interior by 3.4 percent. Then the next year when he had the full control of that budget working with the Democratic Congress, was it cut? No. This time, the increase was even better, over 10% increase in the budget. So within that two-year time, a 14% increase in tough economic times. That sounds pretty good, doesn't it? It's not all. Because the president was concerned about sparking the economy. You don't stand still. And he led out with the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act. And sometimes when major legislation in the past years, the past decades, come down like that, are Indian Affairs included? Too many times in the past, the answer is no. But not this time. The President of the United States and the Congress stood with the President in making sure that Indians were included across Indian country. And so it was not an increase of 14 percent in the first two years, but adding in the one-time money for what we call ERA, it amounted to a 36 percent increase for Indian Affairs. Now, does that deserve a little applause? Let me just let me just conclude by, you know, just recognizing what is the reality today. We have a split Congress now. The Republicans control the House, the Democrats the Senate. It's more difficult now to get these budgets through. And you read about this pretty much every day in the newspapers, right? You saw that in 2011, the federal government almost shut down because they were operating on continuing resolutions rather than passing one appropriation bill for the entire year. They take it weeks at a time, sometimes days at a time. I think there was a series of seven or more continuing resolutions, and the government did almost shut down. And once the Republican uh, leaders controlled the House of Representatives, then every time a continuing resolution came through, they were exacting billions of dollars in cuts. <clears throat> so you knew that we were going to be in line, right? You could feel it. The good old days, maybe we're gone, we were going to be facing tougher budgets, but, you know, it was good news to me to see that because tribal leaders are stepping forward and, you know, letting their voice be known, that we were not suffering the deep cuts during those continuing resolutions that came through. Eventually, when they finally set the budget by continuing resolution for the entire year, we did suffer less than 1% cut. But the good news is that even within Interior, we were treated better than any of our sister bureaus or agencies.
agencies with an interior, and that's usually not the case. Nothing to take away from the national parks, fish and wildlife, the reclamation, or uh, BLM, you know, our sister agencies, but these are people, native people. I get a little emotional about this because I've been in 43 states in the past 29 months. I've been all over Indian country. I don't know how many of you saw the television program the other night on ABC television mm -hmm. about Pine Ridge and the way that Native people have to live. And I know that it's not confined to Pine Ridge. It's here at Navajo, too. It's in different communities. It's in Alaska. It's back east. It's in the south, in the Midwest, in the west. Some tribes are able to prosper economically, but many tribes, most tribes, are not there yet. And we need to continue to work to help people. We'll do all we can within Interior Indian Affairs and working hard on that budget. And we reach out to you as the most significant and powerful tribal nation among those 565 to work with us in partnership to advance your people, but at times when needed to join to help our brothers and sisters and other tribes across the country to achieve prosperity. And I believe that we're seeing a new day in age where the dark chapters of the past you know, are vanishing away and we're doing better things in the future. I'm pleased to be with you today to deliver that message to you, and I just pledge that we will do all we can to partner with you to address the issues that are of concern to you and to do the best that we can. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker.